What is a recession? What's really going on with inflation? Why are stocks crashing? Just what the heck is going on right now? And what does this all mean for you? To help answer all of those questions, I'd like to bring it back to where it all began. The purpose of my original Cash College series was to help people understand complicated financial topics that affected them. So I thought it would be fun to do a Cash College mini series on what's happening right now. And in this mini series, I'd like to cover a range of topics such as what is a recession? How does it actually affect you? What the heck is going on with inflation? What, what even is that? And how do interest rates and central banks tie all of this together. I want to try and explain all of this in a super accessible way because these are things that affect all of us, whether we like it or not. But before we get to those episodes, I'd like to start at a very important place. What can we do to survive all of this? By survive, I of course don't mean life or death. An economy going into a recession is actually not the end of the world. In fact, in a capitalist society, this is a very important and necessary process, something similar to a forest fire that cleanses the forest and makes space for new growth. In the same way, a recession clears the economy out of all of its junk, resets things a bit and allows us to move forwards, hopefully in a more responsible way. I'll explain this process more in detail in one of those future episodes, but for now, what I really wanna focus on is the fact that unfortunately, recessions are painful, at least in the short term. It's painful because, well, simply put, it makes the average person more poor at least temporarily. If you're currently employed, it could mean losing your job. If you run your own business, it could mean that clients start to dry up. And if you're unemployed, it could mean that it's harder to find work. So our income is at risk. And when I say our, I mean it. Mine too. I've already started to see the impacts of advertisers cutting back on their marketing budgets. And our overall net worth is at risk. If you happen to own assets like stocks or housing, then you've probably noticed that they're not worth as much as they were one year ago. In fact, in our last major recession, the average family lost one third of their net worth. I mean, look at how frustrating this is. As families worked really hard to build their wealth up, it grew, but then only to collapse in a recession. I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want that to happen to me. So let's go over a few ways we can protect ourselves in uncertain economic times. You've probably noticed that a lot of people use the seasons as a metaphor for a lot of things that happen in life. Well, right now imagine that it's a sunny day and you're a farmer attending to your hay, I guess. What do they actually do with hay? Make hay, hay bales, I guess? I don't know, I, I, I'm not a farmer, I'm just a small scale vegetable gardener. Anyway, in my observation, it appears that the sun is still shining on the economy, but there are some very dark clouds out there in the distance that are approaching. Now we, being the smart farmers that we are, are we just going to kick our feet up and relax at that? Take a little afternoon nap, just chill out a bit, maybe coast a little, you know, we, we, we've been working so hard lately and those clouds don't look too bad. Let, let's just relax. Mm, yeah, I don't think that's what we should do. If the sun is shining right now, we need to be making as much hay as we possibly can because the sun does not shine forever. So what the heck do I actually mean by this? Like I said, not a farmer and I'm assuming that you're not, but if you are, that that's pretty cool, I guess. And then you probably get me, right? But for everybody else, what I'm saying is if you're employed, unemployed, a student running your own business, I do not think now is the time to be getting complacent and chilling out. It's the time for reminding your boss why you're so valuable or preparing that extra hour for that interview you have tomorrow, or it's taking on those clients that you don't really want to. Because even just a few months from now, you could have a termination notice on your desk, nobody calling you back, 
or all your clients have dried up. Bears in the wild instinctively know when to start harvesting more food to bulk up for the winter months. They understand that summer does not last forever. They understand there is a time to thrive and a time to survive. But we as humans aren't so good at this. We tend to extrapolate what's happening now in this very moment out into the future. It's the reason why we see something like a stock chart that's going up and then we want to buy that stock because we look at the chart and we think that if the past did this, then the future will probably do that too and the chart will continue on its same path. But a bear, if it could read stock charts and speak, I guess, would tell us that this is silly because we are looking at summer and winter is coming. Depending on how severe of an economic downturn is ahead of us or that we are already in, the time to thrive could be waning and the time to survive could be fast approaching. This sunlight that might be shining on you right now does not last forever. So if you still have it, I would implore you to make hay, my friend. Make as much hay as you possibly can. Now, what should we do with that hay as the sky turns gray on a gloomy day down by the bay? Okay, I'm done, sorry. What should we do with the money that we are making? One of the best things you can do to get through a recession much more safely is to remain as liquid as possible. Liquid? What the heck does that mean? How can I be liquid? I'm pretty sure our bodies are made up of something like 60% water, but I, I, th I think we still consider ourselves to be solid. So how do we be more liquid? Terrible jokes aside, being liquid in financial terms has nothing to do with, well, liquids. It's actually just a fancy financial term basically describing how easy it is for you to access cash if you need it. Someone who is highly liquid just means that they can very easily access cash to pay for an expense to invest or make a different financial decision. Someone who is illiquid on the other hand means that they have trouble coming up with cash to do things with it. If you had an unexpected expense of $1,000 do today, right now, how easy would it be for you to pay that? Your answer to this question gives you a little bit of insight into how liquid your financial situation is. Another helpful way to understand this concept is to look at a house, a stock, and just straight cash. A house is the least liquid of the three because it takes a while to actually sell your house and turn it into cash. There's, you gotta do the listing, you gotta do the viewings, you gotta do the paperwork, all of this stuff. A stock is moderately liquid because you can sell the stock on an exchange pretty much instantaneously in most cases and then have the cash in your brokerage account which you can then transfer out. But cash? Cash is the most liquid, and that's because it is just pure purchasing power. We pay for basically everything with cash. Now by cash, I don't mean physical cash necessarily. It can be credit card, it can be debit card, it can be electronic means of payment as well. Now, there's an important distinction to make here. Being e-liquid doesn't mean that someone is poor, and being liquid doesn't mean that somebody is rich. For example, a CEO with a giant house and a fancy car could be somebody who's actually pretty low in liquidity. That's because all of their wealth could be tied up in those luxurious things. As I've just shown you, since something like a house or even a car takes a while to convert into cash, well, all of their wealth could be kind of trapped in these things and they could actually be pretty cash poor. And you'd actually be surprised how many people there are like this who appear rich on the outside, but they actually have very little cash in their bank account or financial security in general. So really, we could potentially be in a more healthy financial situation by just being more liquid than this CEO. And the easiest way to do that is by building 
an emergency fund. Surprise! If you've been watching the channel for a while now, then you'll know that I talk about these a lot. And I'm not going to stop. An emergency fund is something a responsible person would tell you about while your eyes glaze over. Emergency fund? Pfft, fam. You ever heard of NFTs? That's some real financial security right there. No cap for real. That's what everybody was saying last year anyway, but uh appears to have gone a bit silent now. Turns out maybe JPEGs of a, of a rock shouldn't be worth as much as a mansion. Who would have thought? By the way, if you feel a bit personally attacked, don't worry. I did some dumb stuff too last year, I think. Nothing quite that dumb though, but I mean, hey, at the end of the day, we're basically just chimpanzees with computers. So yeah, I mean, maybe let's listen to some of that age old kind of classic financial wisdom stood the test of time for a reason. So an emergency fund is traditionally three to six months worth of living expenses set aside in a high interest savings account. So for example, if I spend approximately $3,000 per month, then I would want to save at least $9,000 and then move that money into a good savings account. I personally use two different savings accounts. I have them linked down below and they're currently paying at least 1.5% interest on any money you park there. And for what it's worth, the classic traditional best practices with something like an emergency fund or just general financial planning is to build this fund before you actually start doing things like investing. If you don't yet have an emergency fund and you're doing other stuff with your money, it might be a good idea to take a second and think about that. In my personal opinion, having an emergency fund should be the very first thing that somebody accomplishes with the money that they save. Unless they have something like debt with a really high interest rate, in that case, it might make more sense to tackle that first before moving on to building your emergency fund. But both of those things should probably come before you start investing your money. So that covers increasing your liquidity in a defensive sense. Basically, doing your best to save as much money as you can per month, moving that saved money into a good savings account with a good interest rate until you hit your desired target, at which point you leave it alone, unless you absolutely need to touch this money. And hopefully, you don't. Between these two actions, making as much hay as you possibly can while the sun is still shining, and protecting all that hard-earned hay that you've harvested, I don't know, you'll put yourself into a great position to not only survive a recession, but thrive on the other side of it. In the wake of the cleansing forest fire of a recession, it makes space for new growth to happen. And by staying strong in the recession, you will be able to participate in this new growth. If you enjoyed this video and you would like to learn more about our current economic predicament and what it means for you, make sure to subscribe and check out the future episodes. I'm Steve Antonioni, and this has been the first episode of a new Cash College mini series. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're well and that I see you again soon.